Hi, my name is Jordan Wilson. Today we're back to take another look at dollar cost averaging. And our focus today is how it can promote consistency in your investing patterns. Now I think there's probably three general approaches if you lump sum invest. In scenario one, you have the cash already sitting in your bank account. Maybe you've inherited money, maybe you're wealthy. So you do your research, select an investment, and on day one you buy 100%. And in that scenario, over the longer term, lump sum investing will outperform dollar cost averaging. Now the problem for the rest of us is that we probably don't have money just sitting around in our bank accounts to invest. So we need to slowly accumulate that cash over a time period. In the first option, we decide we want to invest $12,000. And it may take three, may take six, nine, 12 months to accumulate that money to invest. So we wait till we've got the money in the bank, then we do our research, select an investment, and buy 100%. Same as the first scenario, except it takes us a time period to actually generate that capital. In the third option, we identify an investment up front. We really like Apple, or we really like Facebook. And we say, okay, to properly invest in that, we're gonna need $5,000. Then we slowly accumulate the cash. When we hit that critical mass, we buy the shares. The difficulty with this approach is that if it takes you six to 12 months to accumulate the capital, you need to reassess whether that is still a good investment or the right investment versus what the market is doing a year out or what the competitors are doing or what other options are available in different asset classes that might provide a better return based on the risk of the asset. So you might be identifying investments that you like today, but if you can't buy them for a year, you probably have to go back and reassess. And we talk about waiting, you know, the three, six, nine, 12 months. That's not unrealistic for many people, especially if you're investing in individual stocks. If I want to go out and buy one share of Google, it's trading at about $2,000 US as I record this. Amazon, 3,000 US. So how much money will I need, even if I just buy one share of some of these companies to create a well-diversified portfolio? And I think we talked before, you know, roughly maybe 30 equities. So if I'm paying 500 to $3,000 a single share, and I need to buy 30 different companies, that can be a lot of money to accumulate over a period of time. And even with funds, those can tend to be pricier, perhaps. A lot of funds may require 500 to $2,000 for an initial purchase, and then subsequent purchases can be done at $50, for example but you need that critical mass perhaps just to get your foot in the door with the initial purchase. And even exchange traded funds can be pricey. The two I have listed here, Spiders and Diamonds. SPY is the S&P 500 index ETF. It's trading at $400 US. The Diamonds, for the Dow Jones, trading at $330.
So yes, one spider or one diamond gives you some good diversification in the US equities, but you still probably need to come up with a critical mass a little larger than that, because every time you buy or sell a spider, you're paying say $10 in a transaction fee. And if you're only buying one unit or one share at a time, that can add up. So that's kind of the lump sum approach. If you have the money today, great. If you don't, you're going to have to accumulate and buy. Dollar cost averaging, a little bit more consistent and still some of the same problems, yes, of the lump sum approach. But you're consistent consistent in that you're continually investing. So you come up with that initial capital to buy the no load index mutual fund. And then after that, it's only say $50 each month that you contribute. So it's consistent. And you can set predetermined time periods. Maybe I want to buy monthly, bi monthly. And if you're doing it on your own through ETFs, again, you can set aside through direct deposits or direct debits into your investment account, maybe 50 or 100 or $200 every month and set a target in your investment plan that every three months you will invest in specific exchange traded funds. And then as your life changes, hopefully you add wealth and add cash flow to your life as you advance, then you can bump up those amounts. And I think that sort of ties in to me anyways, with the behavioral aspect of investing, that psychological side. And I think that direct deposit or the direct debit approach is good because it becomes like your phone bill or your utility bill or your rent. Each month the money comes out of your account and after a period of time you don't feel it anymore. You don't think about your cell phone bill or your Netflix subscription. So in the case of dollar cost averaging, you're paying yourself as if you are an expense. And then over time, you're going to just reprioritize your life and you end up forgetting about it. And that tends not to happen with a lump sum approach. And there's a few reasons for that in large part, because it's a significant amount that you have to invest. And maybe you're not quite sure today, the markets are perhaps overheated. Should I wait six months? Markets will correct. I had this discussion on the weekend with someone. Should I wait? Well, you can wait, but maybe that's not the right approach. And at least with the dollar cost averaging, you're promoting that consistency. You're not worrying about market timing or market corrections and whether or not to jump in or not. It's just every month or every two months you're investing X amount. And that's great. The other thing I note here is the cost effectiveness of dollar cost averaging. So if I have $500 that I can invest every month, which is a significant amount, then when we looked at Google and Amazon to buy one share of either company, I may have to wait a few months in the case of Amazon at $3,000 US. I might have to wait six months just to buy one share of that. And that exposes me to the stock specific non-systematic risk inherent in Amazon. So ideally I'd want to buy Amazon, but I'd also want to buy, you know, 15 or 20 other companies to spread that risk out. So you can't really do that in lump sum investing. 
with individual assets if you don't have uh, a large capital base to start with. But even here, like dollar cost averaging is better or lump sum investing for small amounts is better for funds than individual assets because you're buying, hopefully, a well-diversified portfolio already built in. The S&P 500 gives you exposure to 500 different companies. Now, they're all skewed high cap U.S. domestic stocks, so that's creating less diversification, but it gives you more than just buying one share of Amazon or Google. So that's more of a cost effective approach. And the final thing I want to discuss on a consistency side is some people equate consistency with buy and forget. I've set up my Fidelity mutual fund account. It's going to take $300 every month and invest it in these three mutual funds. So I get great diversification at $100 per month in three different accounts. But is Fidelity still a good fund company to invest in? Are the three funds that you chose still the best. And I say that because I assume that when you initially invested in the Fidelity three mutual funds, that you'd done your research and that they were in the top tier for the asset classes or subclasses that you wanted to invest in. But things can change. Maybe the funds are not outperforming their benchmark if they're actively managed. Maybe the funds have significant tracking error, so are underperforming the benchmark if they're passively investing. Maybe the expense ratios have crept up. Maybe there's new competitors that have come along, like, say, Vanguard, with lower-priced funds. So you still have to do some work. And that's especially true in my first comment. If you're investing in Amazon or Google, like individual assets, then you have to do a lot of work to make sure that they're still a suitable investment for your portfolio. And then when you move into funds, you just have to realize that not all funds are well diversified. The Dow Jones 30 has 30 companies that are sort of the movers and shakers of the U.S. economy. Yeah, 30 stocks is diversified, but the fact that they're U.S. domestic mega stocks loses some of that diversification because you don't have exposure to the U.S. small cap market. You don't have exposure to the European markets. So you still have to worry about, is my fund well diversified? And then even well diversified can still have the issues. I just talked about competitors. Maybe that fund that you own doesn't rank up versus other funds. So you still have to do some work, whether you just have a well diversified fund or you're investing in individual assets. A potential advantage of dollar cost averaging is buying at a discount. So because you're putting in $300 per month and investing that on a consistent basis, when the markets rise, you're only able to buy fewer assets on a relative basis. When the markets are falling, you're able to buy more assets. If you have a mutual fund and it's trading at net asset value of $100 a unit and you're investing $200 per month into that fund at $100 that gets you two units but in an up market say the price rises to $200 a share you're only able to buy one unit so as the markets rise 
your fixed dollar amount gets you less value. But when the markets fall, so we're in a market correction or we're in a extended bear market. And first the fund price falls to 75. Instead of being able to buy two units, now you're able to buy more. When it falls to 50, your $200 now gets you four units instead of two and so on. So over time, you're kind of smoothing out the bear markets and the bull markets to some extent. And yes, it'll cost you a bit in a higher market, but you're able to buy in at discounts. And this doesn't reflect timing the market. It's just because I'm investing on a consistent basis. We smooth out our purchasing patterns. And when we reviewed market volatility a few episodes ago, we saw that in the long run, markets rise. But in the shorter run, and by shorter in this context, we're talking in our examples, you know, up to 20 years, there was huge short-term volatility. So by being able to buy on a consistent basis into down markets or volatile markets, that gives an advantage to dollar cost averaging. And then again, that you cannot just invest and forget. It doesn't matter what investment you have. It has to be part of the periodic, maybe that's annual review process where you take a look at the asset and decide going forward, is this still the best asset for me to invest in? Now with a well-diversified exchange traded or mutual fund, that's probably less of a worry than owning Facebook or Netflix. But you still just can't say, yes, it's a diversified fund that I found 10 years ago and it's still great. I'm just going to keep investing forever. You need to sort of just periodic review against your investor profile, against your target asset allocation, against your financial objectives. Decide, does this still make sense? And then look and compare to the competitors and other funds in a similar asset class or subclass to decide, should I keep this investment going forward? So while dollar cost averaging does simplify things, if you're invested in a well diversified portfolio, it's not a no brainer approach. That's all that we're going to discuss today on consistency. We'll look at discipline in our next session. And in many ways that's quite similar, but uh, I just wanted to keep it a bit separate. And then we'll look at quality to finish off. Thank you very much for your time today. Have yourself a good one.